It was late at night, it was dark, it was in the woods. I was shining the torch ahead of me and I saw something light and white. And as I got closer, I realised that it was Jody, and she was dead. It's being described by police as one of the most violent murders in a generation. This would have been a bloodbath. 14-year-old schoolgirl killed in broad daylight. Jodie Jones had everything to live for, but her life was cut cruelly short when she was brutally attacked. She'd put up an enormous fight. There was evidence of a struggle. The area was heavily bloodstained. She was virtually decapitated. This was probably the most shocking and horrific murder in Scottish criminal history. Children being accused of horrendous crimes tends to attract a massive amount of outrage. He was a Satan-worshipping, scary, gothic character. This is a little village and we've got a devil worshipper. You can just imagine the fear. Mitchell was convicted and jailed for a minimum of 20 years. Mrs. Jones, are you happy that justice has been served today? I've been locked up for a crime I did not commit. I can't be more clear. I absolutely did not kill Jody. Duckheath's the biggest town in this area. Originally a market town, but eight miles from Edinburgh. In a sort of semi-circle, there's maybe half a dozen little interlinked villages. Some of them were mining villages, some of them grew up out in the market town of Dalkeith. Nothing ever really happens here. It's an ordinary place with ordinary people. Teenagers Jodie Jones and Luke Mitchell lived in the neighbouring villages of East Houses and New Battle. They had been dating for five months. I met her a few times, not a lot, but I met her a few times. Typical 14-year-old, shy but not to the awkward stage and not cocky, just a lovely, well-mannered wee girl. 30th of June, 2003. Jody and Luke arranged to meet as usual after dinner. A very, very ordinary Monday. Couldn't have been more ordinary. Mm, but as it turned out, it wasn't, was it? Jody doesn't arrive to meet Luke. And just after 10 p.m., her family realise she hasn't been seen since five o'clock a search party is arranged to find her. Luke came to me in a bit of a state saying, Jodie's missing. And he borrowed the torch and off they went. Luke meets Jodie's family at the top of Rowan's Dyke Path, a woodland shortcut connecting both their homes. Waiting for him, at the top of the path were Judy's sister Janine, her gran, Alice, and Janine's boyfriend, Stephen Kelly. So they all set off down the path and they're just past this break in the wall and Luke goes over the wall 
and he calls out, I think there's something here. The sister's boyfriend, Stephen Kelly, then goes over the wall and the granny, well, she wants to see for herself what's there. And she started screaming. Jodie had been beaten. Her hair had been pulled out by the roots. She'd been strangled. Her throat was cut between 12 and 20 times. She was virtually decapitated. Jodie Jones was found hidden in woodland on the other side of a wall running alongside a path. Tonight there is a very real deep sense of shock that a crime like this has happened here. From the minute the news of the murder broke on the morning of July 1st, the, the hysteria the relentless media coverage, the fear, the fact that something like that could happen in this area. Detectives have warned Dalkeith teenagers starting the summer break to be on their guard. There's a maniac roaming among us. Police have staged a reconstruction of the last known movements of murder teenager Jodie Jones. Tonight, motorists were being asked if they were here a week ago. Jodie's clothes are undergoing forensic examination. I got a call from a police officer. They wouldn't tell me what had happened, just that they were taking Luke and Mia, our dog, to the police station and could I meet them there? Then we were questioned about that night and they, they tape your, your conversations and my tape was marked witness and I noticed that Luke's tape was marked suspect. It appeared that Luke Mitchell was now prime suspect. Police believed he had led the search party to Jodie's body, a location only her killer could have known. It seemed 14-year-old Luke Mitchell had become the prime suspect in his girlfriend's murder. A police search of his house revealed more about his character. Mitchell had really highly peculiar habits at home. He was storing up jars of urine in his room. He was a dope-smoking, kind of feral youth. Um, scary gothic character. They found satanic slogans on his school jotters. And one of the things that made this case seem really scary, really terrifying, was this emphasis that Luke Mitchell was a devil worshipper, that he was into the occult. And he was obsessed by the Black Dahlia murders. Jodie's injuries were said to have some similarity to those of a murder victim known as the Black Dahlia, a young woman who had been mutilated in a ritualistic killing. The Black Dahlia case was the killing of a young woman called Elizabeth Short in um, Los Angeles in 1947. She was found horribly mutilated. She'd been severed in two, so the legs and the torso had been separated. Was Mitchell inspired by the Black Dahlia? The case against Luke Mitchell was building. The police were closing in, and the press began to name him as the main suspect. This stuff was being gobbled up insatiably in broadsheets as well as tabloids. It's got a kind of horror movie element to it, you know, this is about a young girl who's 14 who's found brutally murdered. Add in that, all that crazy stuff around devil worship and drugs, and you have a really kind of toxic brew that, uh, that, that people couldn't get enough of. The press just ran amok. 
They were virtually camped outside our door with their sandwiches and flasks, flinging themselves on my car when my car left the driveway just to get a close-up of Luke. There was the story which became enormous of Luke Mitchell being asked not to attend the funeral of, of Jody Jones. We weren't allowed to go to Jody's funeral and I asked why and they said because the family were frightened that we would turn it into a circus. On the day that the funeral happened, um, he decided to sit down with Sky News and do an interview. Sky came to my door and I told them, yes, we were having a vigil for, for Jodie. So they asked if they could come in and to witness that. I thought, what harm can it do? Um, in fact, I thought it would do better because there, there was a whisper of, say, Luke not caring a jot and he was unemotional and he was this, that and the other. And I thought, well, at least if we show them this, then at least they know we are thinking about her and we do have emotions and whatnot. So I let them in and basically that horrible little man started almost interviewing Luke. What would you say to those who would look at you and think, he killed his girlfriend. I just said they're being naive. Not to believe everything you read in the papers. It's trial by media. The interview itself had a rather unpleasant sort of vibe to it. The police and accusations and things I couldn't care about. It was just... Just want to find out what happened and who did it. It felt strange to watch. Uh, there was judgments made about the relationship between um, Mitchell and his mother. It added to the creepiness and the disturbing nature of the story. And the headlines the day after that, the screeching headlines, how could you? Yeah, the public turned against us with that one. A 15-year-old boy has been remanded in custody after appearing in court charged with the murder of Jody Jones. Luke Mitchell was finally arrested on the 14th of April 2004, 10 months after Jody's murder. At around 7.30, the police arrested the youth at his home and brought him back here to the station. His alibi that he was at home cooking dinner was rejected and his mother and older brother were arrested. We understand that she's going to be charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice in connection with this case. The final plank in the police case against Luke Mitchell was that his mother gave a false alibi to protect him. Innocent or guilt, there's something wrong with this conviction. We have a 14-year-old boy, and despite extensive investigation, there is no forensic evidence to link him to the crime. The evidence is insufficient to say beyond a reasonable doubt that this was Luke Mitchell that committed this murder. If we're going to find somebody guilty, it has to be on the basis of solid evidence beyond reasonable doubt. That hasn't happened in Luke's case. We're talking about a person's life, and you need science to, to put someone in jail. I've not spoken out in all this time. because every time I've tried to speak out, I've been shouted down and just been called evil and manipulative and twisted. I can't be more clear. 
I absolutely did not kill Jodie. And I've been locked up for a crime I did not commit. I will not admit to something I've not done. I want to clear my name. My name is John Salins, I'm 27 years a police officer, most of my time as a detective. I've worked in many high profile inquiries, murders, uh, terrorism, serious and organised crime. Uh, spent most of my time in the CID. My name is Michael Neal. Started off as a uniformed officer in the north of Glasgow. Trained as a firearms officer during that time and then moved into the CID arena. Spent the majority of my career after that as a detective. John and I now run our own private investigation company. With a combined 50 years experience, the former detectives have agreed, for the purposes of this documentary, to re-examine the case against Luke Mitchell. The difficulty of being asked to reinvestigate a case that's 17 years old and in this case especially where someone's been convicted of that murder and, and been in prison I suppose the biggest difficulty for John and I will be to keep an open mind It may well be the case that we think Luke Mitchell is guilty but we don't know until, until both of us have investigated it We'll start right at the beginning What do we know, the basics, what do we know about this case? Uh, you know, Luke Mitchell was found guilty by a majority verdict. 14 year old at the time of the murder, mm -hmm. 16 year old at mm -hmm. the time of the trial, mm -hmm. okay? Sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years. We are doing things retrospectively now without the full knowledge of what the investigation team carried out. We are just trying to conduct this investigation based on our own experience and things that we'd have, we would have done at the time. What have we got forensically? The time There's absolutely nothing forensically. It's a circumstantial case. You would think, considering the brutality of that murder, there would have been something forensically. Luke has maintained his innocence. I mean, he had the opportunity to, to, to say that he was guilty of this uh, and it would have made a difference to his length of sentence, but to, he's adamant that he hasn't committed this murder. Right, OK. Right, so why don't, why don't we go through there and visit the crime scene? Well, we'll certainly go out and get a feel for it. Eh? We'll do that. Lovely place as well, isn't it? Nice wee quiet town. I think we're far away now. That's it there, that path there. That's what it is, yeah. Let's go. So it's just a straight track up here, right? I was a crime scene manager for about five years. You've got to think like a suspect. What can I take from this that's going to help me find out who has committed this crime? If you can retrieve evidence from the actual scene of the crime linking the accused to the crime, it doesn't get any better than that. Is that it? That is. We'll just try to establish exactly where the body was found. It's hard to see. I mean, you're talking 17 years ago for this so bit. Right? This, this bit here. See it? I can lay down. You can have to put me into the position. Right. Hands behind my back. Uh, Jodie was had injuries to her throat area. Her throat was cut. And she'd suffered slash marks from uh, the right hand side of her mouth towards her ear, halfway towards her ear. Uh, there was there was incised wounds to her forearms, her breast, her eyelids, her abdomen area. Her hands had been tied behind her back using her own trousers. It's uh, We're painting a picture here and it sounds gruesome, but trust me, it's horrendous. The injuries Jodie received, absolutely horrendous. This would have been a bloodbath. The person that carried out this, this brutal murder 
would have had definitely had blood on him. Uh, and some defensive injuries. And Jody, Jody, Jody put up a fight, so it was every likelihood he'd scratches and bruises. Given the amount of blood that was um, generated, um, I would say that there should be a reasonable chance, a reasonable expectation um, of finding some kind of uh, evidence being transferred from the victim uh, to the assailant. Forensic teams removed more than 100 items of evidence from the murder scene, including hair, saliva, semen and blood. People assumed that there must have been masses of DNA that linked Luke to the case, identified Luke as the killer. It comes as a bit of a shock to most people to realise there was no DNA whatsoever to link Luke to the murder, to the murder scene, or to link Jodie to Luke. So, nothing. They find nothing in such a brutal crime scene as this. Bear in mind that, that, that Luke Mitchell's fingernails were scraped and they had dirt in them. If he'd washed, that wouldn't have been the case. We're talking about a mutilation. I, I mean, it's horrific. Absolutely horrific what's taking place. So to get, to get out of here, get home, destroy everything, every single piece of DNA evidence that could possibly be on your body, I, I find it unbelievable. There was DNA, male DNA, at the scene and on the body, but it wasn't Luke's. Forensics found DNA on a blood stain on Jodie's T-shirt. DNA from Stephen Kelly, Jodie's sister's boyfriend. That implicates Stephen Kelly more than it implicates Luke Mitchell because there was nothing found from Luke Mitchell. This was the only full DNA profile they had from Jodie's body or her clothing. You would have thought they'd have gone straight to his door and gone, eh, you have some explaining to do. Why didn't they do that? The explanation given by the prosecution in court for Kelly's DNA was that Jodie had borrowed her sister Janine's T-shirt that night. A wider search of the area around Jodie's body revealed Stephen Kelly's DNA wasn't the only male profile found. Forensic searches from the crime scene found DNA from Jodie's sister's boyfriend on clothing. But another male profile was also found, in a used condom close to Jodie's body. That condom was found to have what was described as fresh semen. The police didn't find the owner of the condom in the initial investigation. He was traced three years later in 2006 when his DNA was put through the national database in relation to a different incident. It would seem significant in terms of the, the nature of the crime, um, given that it was a young female and there was a condom found with semen. Um, I think it should have had more significance than it apparently did. What stood out for me in particular was the lack of scientific evidence against the accused and the fact that they had other potential line of investigation and just they focused on just one person. We've only been here a short space of time. Straight away we, we, we spoke about another two potential suspects. Luke Mitchell was the only member of the search party to be forensically examined by the police that night. The visit here today for us is very worthwhile. The biggest thing for us is if those four people were here and found that body, why was it only Luke Mitchell that was taken in yep. to be interviewed? All four of them should have been treated at that point as the same. Yep. Uh, but it just seems to be it was only Luke Mitchell and there doesn't seem, at this moment there doesn't seem to be a reason for that. It's obvious from the police treatment of me that I was a suspect from day one. I was told to sit separately from the rest of the members of the search party. 
and I, one of them had uh, tried to hand me a cigarette when we were sitting waiting and they were told that they shouldn't be having any interactions with me yet the other three were sat together all talking together and I was kept separate. I mean this was genuinely from the very first moment that police had arrived that I was being treated separately. I sprinted up to a police station. I asked where my, my child and my dog were. I was shown into a room and the sight was just horrendous. Luke was sitting in a white forensic suit. He'd been stripped naked and he just had a, a tear streaming down his cheek and his eyes were like saucers. He'd been, it looked like somebody hit him right between the eyes with a mallet. That's what he looked like. Total shock. Police would be under pressure from an early stage to make sure that they identified a suspect and arrested someone. But it is possible to lose important lines of inquiry by developing a case theory prematurely. That early closing of minds or the possibility of other suspects can result in lines of inquiry not being taken, which means then that to an extent the investigation becomes an inevitability in terms of where the finger points. An examination of the case files reveals an inconsistency in the stories of how Jodie's body was found that night. You've got the, the granny statement, the sister's statement, the sister's boyfriend's statement, but the first statement they made bears no resemblance to the statement that's used at court. In their first statement, they said that, that Luke's dog, Maya, was sniffing the air and was alerted to something, right? Which is which, what Luke says as well. Which is what Luke says as well, which would indicate that the dog has found something and not Luke, but then as they go on and they put the statement they use at court, the dog didn't sniff the air and Luke went straight to the V, and it makes it look as if Luke knew where the body was. It makes Luke Mitchell as a suspect fit. The defence tried to pursue that. Um, they, they read out the sister's boyfriend's description of the dog. It's an Alsatian, it's a big dog, its head was above the height of the V. That's a very clear description of the dog and how it reacted. And he put it to the witnesses, this is what you said. And they said things like, I don't remember. And, and the first story that they were all telling together just disappears. If three witnesses uh, in their statements are all saying one thing and then by the time of the trial it's changed for each of them but it's changed in the same way, that would certainly prompt some questioning by the Defence QC and I'm sure here Donald Finlay explored that with them and then no doubt pointed out to the jury, well people of course can forget things, people might remember things in different ways but to say the same thing in statements and then to have the same changes in the witness box is something that you might want to have a think about. It'd be interesting for us to have a look through the statements and see where they start to change and if there's anything been suggested to them. Um, has it been suggested to them that this is what might have happened and they've thought, hmm, aye, maybe. Mitchell was 14 years old when he was accused of murdering his girlfriend. He was named by the press within days, but not officially charged until 10 months later. Luke was, when I say he was in the press constantly, I mean daily, absolutely daily. This is five days after the murder, I believe, where we've got detectives hunting the killer of 14-year-old Jody Jones, where last night questioning her boyfriend uh, and his older brother, and Mitchell's named here. So, you know, we have the, uh, the ethical issue. Right at, that, at the start of the case, you know, should we be naming a, a child at this point? Umpteen photos of him, naming him. Now, bear in mind, this is pre-trial. He had not been convicted. He hadn't even been arrested but he was being treated like a criminal. So, I mean, we've got a picture of Mitchell here. 
When you look back on this, it's, it's intensely problematic for how this case is going to be treated by a jury um, in the eyes of the public. Why do people think he did it? Because the police told the press and the press told the public. You worry about how this whole narrative was being framed by the police using the press and, and what that would mean by the time it gets to court. That's really what lies at the, the kind of icky heart of this. The media and the police views almost fed each other and they certainly, to my mind, fed the impression that was being given to the public. What intrigues me the most about this case is, was it the prosecution of a lifestyle? What I mean by that is Luke Mitchell's case seemed to fit in um, with a narrative which was unfolding in the late 1990s and the early 2000s where kids were in effect almost criminalised themselves because of their attitudes or their behaviour. The dope smoking, the violent computer games, the listening to you know music that adults found offensive. I mean, one of the strange things about this case um, is, this, is the whole involvement of Marlon Manson and the Black Dahlia um, uh, story being sucked into the, 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 the narrative of the, the, the Luke Mitchell case. Marlon Manson was fascinated with the Black Dahlia case. Uh, we know that he painted um, watercolours of um, the Black Dahlia victim. And it turned out that the, the prosecution were trying to claim that Luke had carried out a copycat of, of the Dahlia murder from the Manson paintings because he was obsessed with Marilyn Manson. Well, if the kid's into Marilyn Manson and Marilyn Manson's into the Black Dahlia, then, you know, was Mitchell inspired by the Black Dahlia? There was a little bit of a problem there. Or there should have been a little bit of a problem there because there was no evidence at all that Luke had ever seen the paintings or that he knew anything about them. So they took all the computers that, that Luke had access to. None of them had accessed those paintings. If this website is what he would have had to access in order to see anything to do with the Black Dahlia killing, where's the evidence that he accessed that? And there is none. Other than me being a convenient suspect because I was seen as out of the ordinary and into alternative styles and lifestyles and dress sense and music, I don't know why they went after me like this. It's not as though I had some involvement with the police beforehand, before any of this. I was the local weirdo. It was easy to put it on me, it was easy to make people believe these nasty and evil things about me. The whole idea, I don't know how many times this has to come up in cases like this. They listen to a particular type of music and that drives them to murder. There is no scientific evidence to back up those claims, wherever they've been made but they keep, they keep wheeling that old nugget out because it's sensational. People don't go out and kill because of Marlon Manson. You can't blame Marlon Manson for murder. As the re-examination of the case continues, a disturbing piece of evidence reveals another potential suspect. We've got another person of interest that absolutely shocked me. There's a guy by the name of Mark Kane. He's turned up with scratches in his face. If Luke Mitchell didn't kill Jody, somebody else did. Sound effects. <laughs> in April 2004, Luke Mitchell's mother, Corinne, was arrested and charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice. Eight months later, all charges against her were dropped. This was a caravan sales and the shop sold caravan accessories. I lost everything. Um, started with losing my son. And there's nothing worse as a mother watching your son being taken away from you when 
you can't do anything. You can try, you can try screaming, try shouting, yelling, not going to get you anywhere. And especially when you know he's not done anything wrong because he was with you. And no one listens, no one listens. Then that has a knock on effect. Well, after Luke was convicted, um, obviously this was an easy target. And one night I got a phone call from the police, can you come up? Uh, so I was up here about three o'clock in the morning. To be honest, all I could do was sit in my car and just stare. It was just mind blowing, utter carnage. It wasn't just a couple of broken windows, it was 40 odd caravans, completely trashed. So I sold the house. So now we've got nothing, absolutely nothing. So I'm living here. Not my ideal plan at 61, living with no electricity. So no running water, no toilet. <clears throat> Unfortunately now my health is suffering because of it. No, you're too big to do that now. You're too big to do that now. Yes, you are. <coughs> and here is what used to be my office, um, which is now my bedroom come living room, which I share with Mako here. <laughs> and a few, a few rodents, yes. How long do you want to? What are we coming up six years? Luke. Luke and Mia. An innocent little boy dragged from his home, having done nothing wrong, and then been turned into a monster by the press. Just devastating, completely devastating. God, he just looks so young in that photo. Did you ever wonder whether you could do this anymore? Oh, I'll do it. Um, it's taken its toll, but yeah, I'll keep doing it until he's out where he should be. Um, so I want justice for my boy, end of. At the time, I still feel 16, 17. And I have to remind myself that I'm nearly 32 now. They took me away in April 2004 and I've still not managed to go home yet. But I'm still waiting to go home. after the conviction of Luke Mitchell. Evidence from 2003 reveals another potential suspect who may have been overlooked by the police. We've got another person of interest that absolutely shocked me. See if you go down to number four on that list. Yeah, got it, yeah. You'll see there's a guy by the name of Mark Kane. Yeah. Mark Kane has apparently turned up at his friend's house the day after the murder. He's turned up with scratches in his face. Carried out a wee experiment last night. I want to show you some pictures. Right, first of all, who's that? Right, that's Luke Mitchell. Right. right. Who's this? I don't know who that is, but he's similar. The hairstyle looks very similar to Luke Mitchell. That's what I thought. That's Mark Kane. Joe. Nope. How similar thought, are they? Right. The whole thing rests on eyewitness evidence, driving by and identifying a 
person as Luke Mitchell, and they look so similar. During the police investigation, eyewitnesses Rosemary Walsh and Lorraine Fleming said they had seen Luke Mitchell at the end of the path leading to the murder site on the night of Jodie's murder. The identification by Fleming and Walsh could have been a mistaken identity. And the person that they saw was not Luke, it was Mark Kane, which would have knocked quite a big hole in the prosecution story that Luke was at this end of the path at this time and that end of the path at that time. Another wee trip through to Keith again. was visited by Mark Kane the day after the murder, has agreed to meet with the investigators at the crime scene. This will give us a feeling for it now, a proper feeling. Nothing better than actually speaking to folk direct rather than reading their statements. There's a the gate there and there's the entrance to the, the path. Right. So what's over here? New Bar Abbey College. And that's where Mark Kane was living. So that's the college directly through the trees here? Yes, yes. Uh, so we've got Luke Mitchell staying down there. We've got Jodie Jones staying up there. We've got Mark Kane staying over there. The closest person's obviously Mark Kane. Yes. yes. So you're only, you're only talking a couple of minutes to get wow. from there to there. Yeah, definitely. If you come out of the murder in these woods here, it does not be a perfect escape route. Ah, oh, definitely. Tell me how you know Mark Kane, Scott. I met Mark Kane when I was like, a student at the same time. As an individual, what sort of what sort of person was he? Listen, he was, he was a nice lad in his own ways, but he was a very, very disturbed boy. Very, very disturbed. He carried a a, a eight-inch blade with a brown wooden handle. Kitchen knife. What makes you think that, that, that Mark Kane's involved in the murder of Jodie Jones then? Mark Kane visited my flat in Leith the day after Jodie had been killed. And had big, big scratches on his face. See, I told him a wee girl had been killed. And, um, asked him where he had been and where he got his scratches. He told me he was in New Battle Abbey in the woods. That are the same? Same, same. The base area. of the woods around this field? Yes, yes. Right. He told me he was taking methadone. He had taken his whole script of Valium. He had got a baggy speed, smoking cannabis, and he was drinking lager. See the day you seen him, did he have a knife on him? Ah, he would have had. I've never seen it. you never he, seen it? But he would have had. I told him I was concerned. You know, you've just told me you've been in a, a woods full of drugs. A wee girl's dead, you've got scratches on your face. He told me he fell in a bush. And that's how he scratched his face. And I remember saying to him, that's no scratches for a bush. He got flustered, and then he left. After I left my flat, I was still concerned. Do you think Mark Kane killed Jodie Jones? I genuinely don't know. I've always suspected it. Mick and I would like to, to have a chat with Mark Kane. Is it possible for you to arrange a meeting that we could sit down and, and talk to him about this and, and no, view the no, things that no, you're... No, no, no. Mark, Mark Kane died last year. Mark Kane's dead? Yes, Mark Kane's dead, yes. Last year? Last year, just last year. I think we need to take a look at these two, the moped boys. We've got a witness who sees the moped against the wall, right at the V in the wall in the crime scene, right? Sees the moped leaning against the wall, but doesn't see them there. What time was that? 5.15. The exact time that Jodie was murdered. We decided, right, let's see if we can get Luke to get a polygraph. That, that would be a dramatic, sensational twist in the story. Did you stab Jodie on the 30th of June 2003? 